Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Narayan Murthy, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Aspen Institute India and Janana Prabha, I would like to welcome you this evening to an interactive session with the difference. It is indeed a special privilege to have Mr. Narayan Murthy with us here today. This evening's interaction is titled Extraordinary Leadership. Mr. Murthy, who needs little introduction to an audience in India or abroad, is such a fine example of an exemplary leader who has truly lived his life by the values he holds and believes in deeply. The need for India is to have leaders with values who, would, who, could, be, who could be more uh, critical, uh, not just of what's happening, but also comment on what is happening. Aspen India has been working to promote this aspect in various ways through its India leadership uh, program. Over a dozen fellows are with us here today. They, along with many of you present with us this evening, are the leaders of the future. Individuals who will help in nation building and in creating a more inclusive society. One of the ILF, ILI fellows, Rohit Poda, connected us to Jan Prabha through his mother, Dr. Rashmi Poda, and thus took shape this evening's event. We are indeed very grateful to Rashmi and to the team here for partnering with the Aspen Institute India on this evening's program. And we hope this is just the beginning of a much longer partnership. This evening will be a session with a difference. I will be engaging Mr. Murthy in conversation on his life and his work. And thereafter, I will be opening up to the floor for discussions. So may I now request Mr. Murthy?
improving the quality of our lives. However, when I went to work in France in early 70s, I uh, met with lots of people from the left, the center, and the right. In fact, I met George Marshall, who used to be at that time the head of the French Communist Party, from the belief in that it was the only developed nation which had a vibrant Communist Party. So I read a little bit, I discussed a lot. I, I used to go to Du Mago, where uh, both uh, uh, Jopal Sartre on one side and Simon de Gopal on the other side used to be sitting. But then they were splitting, I think. But then there would be lots of youngsters sitting at different parts and listening to what they said. But after all of this, I traveled also a little bit in uh, Europe. I realized that the only way societies like India can solve the problem of poverty is through creation of jobs. And the only way to create jobs is through entrepreneurship, through industrialization, people who have ideas, money, or both. I think that is when my ideology, which was very strong left of center, got completely bulwarded, as I say, overturned. And I became uh, conservative in economic matters while continuing, continuing to be liberal in social matters. And that's how my philosophy was changed. This was, this was before you joined Infosys, you had already, oh, yeah. already formed a very strong uh, feeling yes. that uh, this, this was going to be your business philosophy. Absolutely. And if you had not gone to France, for an argument says, what do you think might have happened? Somehow I have a feeling that, you know, if I had not gone to France, I would have done my, see, PhD. See, at that time what happened was, I had a scholarship to do my PhD in computer science from uh, Berkeley as well as from Technion Israel. And I had decided to go to Technion Israel because uh, there was a very famous professor there, uh, Shamim, who was working in the area of deadlock resolution in, uh, in resource uh, deallocation. And I would have gone to Israel, I would have done my PhD, hopefully, and I would be a, a teacher somewhere. And teachers, by, by preference, are slightly less percentage. So I would continue to take. So you feel that uh, entrepreneurship was something that uh, was inculcated in you, uh, in your, through your family, uh, or did you, was it something that you felt when you were in France? I mean, when did you feel that entrepreneurship was something that you wanted to be rather than an employee? Uh, well, you know, one thing that uh, both my parents about all the children, pretty independent children. Uh, we chose what degree we wanted to study. We chose what hours of study we wanted to do. There was really no pressure at home on you have to do this, you can't do this, etc. Really, there was no such. Therefore, in some way, uh, the parents had helped us to be independent.
can make this thing. For example, when I went to France, those days, you know, you could send a letter once in a month or so, I don't think it. So they would rarely hear from me. Similarly, when I returned from France, I was hitchhiking and I was on the road for a year. I did not write anything. I just told my parents that I am leaving Paris on this day and someday I will be back in Mysore. I didn't even say whether it will take one month, six months, one year, five years. And I didn't bother to reply. I didn't bother to write to them because there was no address where they could reply all that. So the point I'm making is this. We were gradually becoming independent. And when you bring up children to do independent thinking, I feel the, the probability of entrepreneurship increases because entrepreneurship is all about taking risks. It's all about uh, sacrifice today in the hope of gratification tomorrow. It's all about courage. It's all about uh, converting ideas into, into jobs and wealth. And that requires a little bit of You know, in, in the manufacturing sector, the whole Nehru, you know, the, the philosophy that he brought was self-sufficiency. He Gandhi talked of it also in his own way, in terms of the wage level, etc. Economic independence after so many years of uh, domination. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why did you feel at that stage that services would, would actually be something that, because the ethos of the day was manufacturing. Everybody was, was going into manufacturing and uh, the country was sort of promoting import substitution. Yeah. But this was a very different, uh, very different idea. Uh, that, that services, especially from the, the private sector, that to its software. Uh, I mean, how did you think that, how did that whole idea develop? See, we are all products of uh, our context. When I was doing my graduate studies at Ivy Campus, I had taken control theory, which, as you know, very well, is all mathematics, right? basically mathematics and uh, some electrical engineering. I one Sunday, I had the fortune to listen to uh, Professor Acton, who was a very famous professor from Princeton in uh, numerical analysis, pure science. But he had come down from Princeton on a sabbatical to Ivy Campus. And on a Sunday morning at breakfast, he was talking about how computers were going to change our lives. This was 1967. And how they will become all pervasive, how life will be without, life without computers will be impossible. And he was a true clairvoyant. So I uh, got so <coughs> excited by what he was talking about that I went to, I mean I had asked him for some papers. He asked me to read three or four went to the library, central library, read those papers, and I, next morning, I went and changed my specialization to computer science. And then, all that I knew was programming languages, operating systems, automata theory, database management systems, etc. So that was my context. And in, you know, I mean, I came back to India in 75, 74, 75, and then I said, look, I have to understand how corporations work. Therefore, I, uh, I, I joined PCS. And around that time, four important things happened in the world. One was, in 1975, a judge in Minneapolis ruled that IBM was wrong in insisting that their computer hardware should run only their software. In other words, those days, you wouldn't run 
software belonging to a third party on a computer owned by IBM called Burroughs, you know, Burroughs, Univac, NCR, Cray, or Honeywell, right? IBM at the bottom. That was a very important uh, decision because that opened up huge opportunities for software companies, clearly, one. Second, as you know, 70s were the age when mini computers, 16 bit mini computers and 32 bit super mini computers were introduced by Digital Equipment Corporation, Data General, uh, Apollo, uh, Prime, Kevin Packard, etc. etc. What these machines did was they provided better value for money compared to the main three. And they also were highly affordable. That meant that a large number of corporations in the US and in Europe started using computers more and more. The third thing that happened was around 77, 78, both Digital Equipment Corporation and Data Online Transaction processing platforms based on relational databases. As you know very well that in commercial systems, you have to have an online transaction processing system. What is an online transaction processing system? It's nothing. It's, it's a system that will ensure that all updates to the databases are seen as an indivisible uh, item. That is, let's say that uh, uh, Jamshed, the good friend that he is, he will allow money to be transferred from his account to my account. This transaction has to become indivisible in the sense money should be deducted from his account and it should be credited to my account. If for some reason the system were to fail when the money was credited into account, but not as a debited to his account and not related to mine, that transaction is not complete. So online transaction processing systems allow that all updates to the database, database were done as an indivisible transaction. That, without that, commercial systems can't work. This was not available on super mini computers and mini computers till 1977. This was the and the fourth thing that I saw was that there were lots of smart engineers in India, but they had no jobs, including from IITs. I mean, there was a section of students who went from IITs to abroad to do higher studies and seek opportunities there. But the bottom 50% had very little opportunity. Therefore, we said, why don't create uh, an opportunity for these wonderful engineers to provide systems to corporations in the US and that's how it So the story of uh, how Infosys was financed, including uh, from your wife Sudha, yeah. is well known. It's been written about uh, very often. Thousands and millions of people, you know, want to be entrepreneurs. They start, yeah. they start a business. You started a business yeah. with your friends and partners. Yeah. What, you know, businesses always fail. I mean, the, the statistics are that you know, 90% of plus fail. Absolutely. So, what was it in your that, as far as the business was concerned, the way you did business, yeah. the values that you had, the way you conducted business, yeah. how you dealt with customers? Yeah. What was that that set you apart? That and made you successful? You know, I have often said that uh, an entrepreneur must ensure that there are at least three fundamental requirements. One, I must be able to express the differentiated value of my proposition vis-a-vis -vis my competitors 
in a simple sentence. What did we say? We said we will provide quality software on time within budgeted cost to our customers. That was our differentiated value proposition. At that point in time, less than 45% of the projects got completed on time and about 25% uh, of the projects got a budget. Second, the market must be there. No matter no matter how smart you are, how good is your idea is, if the market does not perceive value for your idea, you will not succeed. Fortunately for us, and in some sense I would say we have done a, a fair amount of thinking about it, there was a huge market explosion happening in the West for large customized software development and there was a huge talent available on this side. So therefore we are matching supply and demand. Third, entrepreneurship is all about deferred gratification. It's all about hard work to pay, sacrifice to pay, in the hope that you will have a better tomorrow. You will have a more prosperous tomorrow. I was very lucky to put together with I must say that every one of them believed in the values that I set forth. And they, we also brought together complementary strengths. They, all of us knew software, but there are some of us who knew finance a little bit better. Some of us will know, will know sales a little bit better. Some knew how to manage people better. Some knew technology a little bit better. You know, uh, between 79 and 82, there were 13 companies founded like ours by people in the IT industry. People who were working in PCS, TCS, you know, many others. There was only one that came this far, that is interesting. And one of the, there, there were a few reasons for that. First one was, we brought complementary skills. Other fellows were all, either they were all marketing guys, they were all technology fellows, they were all finance guys. With the result, when you bring such a group together, pretty soon you will start that only one person's idea starts prevailing. Because there will be probably he or she is the smartest. Others will get bored. Whereas in our case, because we brought people with complementary strengths, if I said something in finance, others would miss it. If Chris said something in technology, the rest of us would miss it. So complementary strengths play an important. Second, I always believe that there should be one leader. There cannot be any two leaders. Committees don't work. And I know several companies out of the 13 who had the three people each had 32 percent and 33 more. That doesn't work because and you know very well, much better than I do. You know, can't run a company on the basis of company. There has to be one leader, and that leader has to derive his strength from his competency, from his leadership potential. He, has, he or she will have sacrificed much more than others. And everybody must simply accept his or her leadership. We were very, very lucky that there were people very, very clear who the leader. And they all 
so much credit. So I think uh, if you have a human being, then you are enhancing the probability. But the key issue is differentiated value proposition and a market that is ready to pay for the value. Without those two, yes. That would be wonderful advice. Uh, to a lot of young people who want to be uh, entrepreneurs today. Now, one of the uh, issues about uh, dynamics, especially of, you know, you have your founding members, and then you have others. The dynamics have to work well. If the dynamics don't work well, as you said, you know, with complementary uh, advantages, etc. But at the same time, you also have uh, issues of style, issues of, you know, nuances in, and differences. And I think most of, uh, you know, not just families, but you know, also businesses fall apart over differences. And how do you manage differences with uh, using, you know, not just that you're the leader, you say, okay, whatever I say goes, uh, but you know, managing this diversity uh, in a way that actually, you know, leads you in a very focused way. How did you manage that? Uh, my father was a great uh, admirer of Mark Malone. And every day at dinner, somehow or other, he would talk about it. So therefore, we are all very influenced by Mark Malone. Mark Malone had one unique attribute which very few other leaders from in, in India have had. And that is he led by example. As you know, Sarojini Naidu used to say, it takes a fortune to keep this man in poverty. Because he would insist on going by third class, he would insist on eating with everybody, that man, or there had to be security people, uh, you know, in plain clothes, there had to be people who make sure that his food is tasted by some people before he ate. All of that was happening behind the scene. But it gave Mahatma Gandhi an extraordinary opportunity to touch base with the ground level people. That gave enormous strength. And I think thanks to his extraordinary ability to lead by example. Be in a loincloth. Even when he went to England, as you people know, when uh, George uh, VI said, isn't it a little bit poor? He said, I mean, when, when the newspaper people asked him, wasn't it a very a bit poor? You are, you are in this loincloth. They don't worry, the emperor had enough clothes for both of us. <laughs> so, I mean, the point is, uh, he understood the power of leadership by example, like nobody. And therefore, that power of leadership by example gave him so much moral strength that nobody would, would disagree. And that was also because he had chosen an aspirational task, which was taken for him. In some way, in some small, small, minuscule way, an emphasis, I chose respect as our primary object. When you choose respect, you're not saying money. You're not saying that, you know, we have become a, then I'll say, how much money goes to Narayan Murthy, how much comes to me, oh, and then in some way that brings down. So I chose this. I said, no matter what we do, we will see more and more respect. So therefore, when you choose an aspirational object, when you choose what is seen as a noble object. What is, uh, what 
cannot be touched, what is not physical, but you can feel it in the air, respect is not such. Therefore, you will inevitably avoid a lot of these ground level conditions. Because it's something that you can feel but you can't touch. It's not something that you can put in your pocket and walk out. That's one. Second, I think if you use data and facts to arise conclusions to all issues, then you eliminate biases. Then you win this time, Mukun wins next time, I win the third time, Dharam wins the fourth time. Then we are all very confident. We all know that in this company there are no clicks. By and large there are no biases. If I have better data, if I have better performance, I can do it. So I think a few of these can be tried. In fact, even Bill Gates told me that he was very, very surprised that he was 70. I don't know if there is another experiment which I can do in the country. And, 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 and so many people have told me, how is it that you people know? I said, my was too very simple. We chose something that was aspirational. We uh, let, for example, sir, we use data and facts to decide on the issue. Sorry, I'm taking a long time out of the If we have to uh, you know, cut to the present, uh, I think uh, uh, there is a very strong feeling that India is underperforming uh, way below its potential. Uh, there have been a number of uh, movements in the country uh, protesting about corruption in public life, in private uh, uh, life also. Uh, the, the role of business has always been under question, always been, but more so now than it has ever been. And there is a feeling that uh, maybe business leaders are not doing enough. Uh, I think that uh, the feeling that if business was more united, was more outspoken uh, on the issue of corruption, on the issue of values, that we would actually be able to uh, make some headway in what is really needed for India to progress. How do you think we should address this whole issue? Uh, I think that It is very, very important for all of us to realize that if, as President Kennedy once said, if a society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. It is very, very important for every businessman in the country to remember to accept. And if a society has to help many who are poor, you like it or not, you have to bring down corruption. Anybody may criticize you or me, it doesn't matter. But the reality is the ability to help the many for poor rests with the public governance system. You will create jobs. Beyond that, and you will pay your taxes. These are, and you will follow all the laws of the land. That's the best you can do. Beyond that, you cannot do anything. But it is the public governance system. Both the politics and the bureaucrats who have enormous power, who have enormous leeway, enormous influence in making sure that the lives of the poor and the hapless 
issues and so forth. If that is not happening for whatever reason, I am not an expert, therefore I cannot comment why. But if I see instances, I think it behooves me to stand up and say, listen. If we didn't do that, as I said, as President Kennedy said, sooner or later, the society will be angry with us, society will not excuse us, and I can assure you that it will tell upon us very simply. Therefore, I do think that we as people have this tremendous responsibility to stand up and say this in a polite and courteous way. See, an emphasis we always say, you can disagree with me as long as you are not disagreeable. So therefore, I think we have to, we have to stand up. You have uh, this idea that uh, business should be more involved in politics. Uh, how do you think that business should be more involved in politics? There's always two sides to this story. Okay? There's the story which says businessmen's job is to run their business well, pay their taxes, follow the laws, etc., etc. They have no business to be in politics. And there's another you know, equally strong uh, view that uh, businesses, if they don't get involved in politics and they don't try to shape uh, the way that uh, the political system works and if not shape it, at least influence it very significantly, that you will continuously, uh, you know, speak at cross purposes and you will not get the, the advancement that you need. In India, we have examples of political leaders who are doing very well. Even in our present situation, you know, Gujarat has had good uh, governance uh, economically. It may not be from a political point of view, but certainly economically they have done very well. Bihar is seeing a huge uh, a change in its outlook. In the so what is it? Is it, is it, do you think that it's, it's strong individual political leaders or that it is civil society that's going to shape, you know, through, through argument, through uh, discussion, uh, through a change from the bottom up. So how do you see this change happening in India? You know, I don't think a corporation can sustain itself without the goodwill and blessings of the society. Therefore, once again, I come back to my earlier point that it is in the interest of you and me to ensure that the society operates optimally. The society looks after everybody to the best of its ability. Whether you and I like it or not, in a democracy, the only instrument you have to bring better governance systems is through elections. And the only instrument that you have to ensure that there better and better candidates stand for elections is through political parties. Therefore, time has come when we have to bring about reforms in the country in terms of contribution from business houses to various political parties based on their ideology based on the kind of candidates that they select, based on their performance in the past election or whatever. 
I think that that is like I mean Tata's already already do that in some way, but they have to be Tata's, Godrej's, Enkis's. Many of us will have to be encouraged to be even more enthusiastic, <coughs> more energetic in this cause by bringing about reforms. I think it is very very must produce an annual report on what are the kinds of uh, programs that they have actually implemented, what is their KPI, what are the kinds of candidates that they have promoted, they what is their money, how much money they have spent on what activity, how much money they have collected.
on a railway platform. The police would come and in, of course in some Asian countries they would not deal with the state. But then they would go. But today you can't sleep like that. I mean I've not tried, but <laughs> but you know I think it's difficult. Therefore it was very easy. And and you know, I mean I went to so many countries in Europe. It was wonderful. Except in the in uh, Eastern European nations and in Russia, you had to agree to spend a certain number of dollars of hard currency per day. For example, in uh, Hungary, in uh, uh, Czech Republic, in Poland, at that time it was eight dollars per day. I think they had all uh, uh, looked at Arthur Frommer's book, you know, and I think Arthur Frommer said at that time some Europe on five dollars a day or something like that. So they had set it at eight dollars. So as long as you were ready to spend it, of course you did not have to spend it, you know, uh, on a room or anything like that. You could say you could go and have some fun, you know, have games, you could do whatever you wanted. Nobody bothered because you you encash the stuff. You had to just encash that much at the bottom. It was fun. Hello, sir. Uh, Mr. Biogesh from NMIMS. Uh, Infosys is the most preferred uh, employer brand today. And everybody wants to join Infosys. Uh, in early days, uh, early days of Infosys, how you uh, your team has defined the right person for a right job, or what is your what was your personal view uh, for these things? It's the right person for a right job. Well, I think you know, if you wrote down the business process of order through remittance, then you will automatically define various nodes where value is added in this chain. In order part, you need sales people, free sales people, marketing people, then as you move down to a certain thing, you need people to produce, right? And when you want to produce, you need people who measure productivity, people who measure quality, people who improve quality, right? Uh, then as you move further down, you need people who will raise invoices on time, collect money on time, make sure that costs are well controlled, etc., etc. So once you write, the business process in adequate detail, then you automatically come to know what kind of talent you need for what activity, and then it's very easy. Sir, so, sir, I'm a bit party from Aspire. I think you touched upon the fact that uh, a country that cannot take care of the poor would even put its rich at risk. Now, we are a country of 1.2 billion, there are 300 million poor, there is high inequality, growth has not been inclusive. What in your mind are the signals that a society like India might be at risk? What would you be looking for to say, hey, we have crossed the tolerance level and this is the time when the bell should be going? Well, in my opinion, Indian society is a unique society. The probability of a revolution happening, the probability of people coming and taking over my house and your house and Jamshed's house, at this point is very low. I tell you for a very simple reason. Once an American friend of mine, this was about 40 years ago. He came and spent about three months in India. And uh, at the end of that, at that time I used to live in Bangladesh. 
so he came and stayed with us. So I asked him, is there one thing unique that you found about India which you have not found anywhere else in the world? I thought he would say no, but he said yes. He was quite impressed in some way, very ambiguous, some way, but some way I got worried. I said, what is it? He said, India is the only country in the world where when I walk into the forest, he went to Dharavi, I was not scared. The poor man smiled at me. He did not have hatred. He did not show anger at me. And then he asked me one of the toughest questions. Why do you think India is like that? And of course, I thought a little bit. I told him, look, I can't answer today. Let me think about it a few days and get back. I spoke to my wife. She is very, very good in philosophy. She reads a lot, much more than I do. And then she said, remember that, the, that we in India, we believe in the theory of karma. What is theory of karma? The theory of karma says that whatever I am in this world, he the result of the good or the bad that I did in my previous life, right? We believe in rebirth. So the fact that Jamshed is a handsome person, he is a rich person, he is a highly educated person, he is because he did a lot of good things in his previous Jamma. It has nothing to do with me. In other words, by my hating Jamshed, I am not becoming better. The only way I can become better in my next birth is if I am a good human being in this world. That was the theory my wife explained to me. And of course, I promptly explained to my American friend, he was thrilled. <laughs> so therefore, why I did invoke President Kennedy's famous uh, sentence, India compared to many other nations has a much higher level of tolerance than, than any other nation. But even we cannot push it too far for a very simple reason. The thanks to television Thanks to ubiquitousness of TV channels across the entire country. Thanks to increasing literacy. The impact of what is happening in other parts of the world is getting to our people in the remotest part much bigger than what, what happened 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Therefore, the influence force is multiplying rapidly. Therefore, the rate of decay of the belief in, of the traditional belief Therefore, the possibility that the, the poor, the disenfranchised, the helpless will wait a long period to slowly increase. That is where I believe, while we don't have to uh, suddenly call for some 20 security guard for us to go home, 
We don't need to do that. But I think by each one of us doing whatever little we can do to ensure that the public governance system improves in its efficiency, efficacy, and effectiveness in adding value to the other sections of the society, I believe that we will be doing a big service to the society and to ourselves. No woman has asked me a question. Okay, we'll come to you next. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Pagnesh Kodar. It was interesting to note how you mentioned that businesses should be more involved politically. But you know, we run a very old traditional business and we want to be involved politically but we don't want politicians getting involved and in interfering in our companies and nor do we want to be seen as being politically inclined to one side or another. How do you think we can balance that while at the same time getting more involved in the functioning of our society? Well, I think there are many ways. As I say, if we can all give CII, FICI, ASOCHEM, you know, all of them come together, NASCOM, all of them come together on the standard platform and then say, and then very respectfully, very courteously uh, request that political parties help us to, to contribute to their well-being by providing uh, annual report, by providing higher level of Transparency and accountability. I think we would have had it. Second, I I think when you see blatant acts of corruption, blatant acts of acts of harassment of the poor. In fact, even the act of violence that you saw yesterday at Maruti, it is extremely important for us to stand up and say, this is not. This is not. We have to stand up. Third, all of us, which of course, God is a great job, God is a great job. All of us have to set apart a part of our profits for making a difference to the other sections of the society. By and large, we are doing that. So it's not, it's not, that's not an area where I would pick a fault with anyone. And when I said we must fight corruption, it also means that we should not be, we should not be one of the parties to that corruption. That is very, very important. Otherwise, you won't be able to And if every corporation can in some way exhort their employees to register for voting and go to the polling booth on the voting day and vote for the most deserving candidate. I think that is also a valuation that we can Um, you talked about the significance of actually a data-driven approach. You just give your name. So I'm with the India Research Center of the Harvard Business School. Um, you talked about the significance of using our data-driven approach and using facts to eliminate biases in a lot of decisions. Uh, you also talked about the importance of political parties actually, um, you know, putting out annual reports. 
Um, you know, in the absence of actually such information right now, I'm, I'm curious to understand how do you decide who is the most deserving candidate, uh, you know, when you go to cast your vote for a, for a candidate, or how do you decide which party to vote for or which, who to sort of select? Well, I think uh, uh, there are very easy uh, indicators. First of all, who is the candidate who visits my constituency most often? Let me uh, tell you that there have been candidates who have come only once in five years. Second, I do participate a little bit in my in in meetings of my area amongst the uh, people there. So we also discuss who is the person who has ensured that this park is good enough. Who is the person who has actually helped the public schools in this area? Who is the person who has ensured that the public schools have reasonable quality of midday meal facility? Who is the person who has ensured that the road you know, has been re-metal reasonably done? So I think if we get to even that level, that is a first step. We don't have to use multi-dimensional scaling or some advanced mathematics to, to discern what one has done and what one has done. I think there are they're all visible uh, signs of progress. India today is an extraordinary when I first went to Paris, India was seen as a condemned you know, uh, nation of poverty, disease, dirt, or filth, all of that. But today, by and large, there is considerable expectation from India. India occupies the high table in most political and economic forum. There is expectation that India will lead in many multilateral uh, discussions. This did not happen in the last 300 years. It's like a more, maybe 400. So I would tell the youngsters that they are at an extraordinary juncture in the history of this country. They have an opportunity which Judge and I did not have. That is making sure that this wonderful <coughs> position that India has got is made durable and permanent. And the only way we can do that is through performance. Because I often say performance leads to recognition, recognition leads to respect, and respect leads to power. Therefore, if India wants to be seen as a powerful nation, there is only one instrument and that is performance. Therefore, I would tell myself, he doesn't mean to that he, I find it much better than I am. Uh, I would tell the instant that this is the time for him to work hard, work smart, come in himself and herself. Because if he didn't do India may lose this extraordinary position that we have got and we may
Um, good evening, I'm Ajayta Gandhi. Um, I want to ask both of you a question. What are your views on God, religion and destiny and their role in your life? You know, I'm a very religious person. But I keep my religion very private between me and my God. I don't attend any religious functions in public. I happen to be in a state recently where the wonderful chief minister took part in a Hindu religious function. I very politely, very respectfully kept away. At emphasis, they wanted to do a, a an office inauguration where they wanted to do some puja. In 1984, I said the only way we can do this is if we call a Hindu priest, a Maori, and a Christian father, give them the same amount of time and same resources. But in private, I am very religious. There is not a single day that I don't pray. Such prayer helps me to be a little bit humble. Such prayer gives me faith. At the end of the day, every one of us may want faith. Husband has faith in wife, wife has faith in husband, that they will conduct themselves properly. You have faith in your subordinate, the subordinate has faith in the boss. So all of us live on faith. Second, faith engenders hope. Without hope, we are all lost. We have no reason to live. If you and I don't hope for a better tomorrow, better next week, better year, I can tell you your energy level will come down and you will not have energy to get up and prepare. So therefore, every one of us need faith and hope. And in what form you get that is your personal choice. Therefore, I think we have to respect the right of each individual to choose the form that he or she wants to sustain faith and hope. In fact, I personally would say that we should never ever discuss our gods, our beliefs, why we believe in this, why we don't believe in this, in any public conversation. It has no value. It only creates dissonance. It only creates unhappiness. So as long as we accept the generic principle that faith and hope or better are required for all of us to do what we are supposed to do day after day after day and be happy, be confident. That's it. You know, uh, <clears throat> there's one line from a poem by Tennyson that I believe in and that's what I basically follow. And that goes something like this. Strong Son of God, immortal love, whom we that have not seen thy face, by faith and faith alone embrace, believing where we cannot prove. That's my philosophy. Here.
So like in many years, uh, you have been uh, and continue to be one a role model for a lot of people, and uh, your thoughts and principles have been a mentor to me and continue to be. And I'm truly blessed to stand in front of you and ask today to interact in person. So my question to you is uh, about the two things that you mentioned about uh, uh, an idea. It needs to have your idea needs to uh, be defined. The value proposition needs to be defined in one line, and the market needs to be ready. So, the, defining the value proposition in one line is a function of the management and who is trying to run it. But uh, can I put you in a spot and ask you what today uh, is the market ready for? And more importantly, uh, what do you think the market is ready for five years hence? Well, you know, I think it depends on it depends on the product, it depends on the service. Uh, you know, for example, let's say that you want to start a medical practice. If you say you will provide the most competent medical advice at the most affordable price. This is a simple sentence. It's not a complex. Of course, it has to be translated to Marathi, Hindi, Kannada. That's a different issue. For example, when Infosys was founded, we said, we will be the most respected software company in India. That sent a clear message to everybody involved in this game. We will develop software, but we will derive respect. So all that I would say is, as you move from year to year, the opportunities change. But each of these can be communicated in a simple sentence. The reason why I said we must communicate, it, communicate the differentiated value proposition as a simple sentence is, what you can communicate in a simple sentence, you can understand very easily. Others can understand very easily. And it can be implemented very easily. In fact, there were many, many ideas that we came up with. But we were not able to express it in a simple sentence. One person said this will do this, another person said this will do something else, third person said it will do this. And we think. So kindly think about this issue very carefully. And my own belief is that if you can communicate the differentiated value proposition in a simple sentence, the entrepreneur is more likely to succeed than my name is Nandeep from our work with SBI Mitchell. I want to ask one thing that due to the leadership and vision of people like you, we have done very well in IT services industry. This country has, has really done well in that field. But we have, in terms of technical leadership, we are nowhere close to US. I mean, the Silicon Valley. Do you see a possibility in the next couple of years or in foreseeable future, somebody in India creating a Google or an Apple or Amazon? Uh, you see, innovation comes from the ecosystem. Innovations depend on the way you have been trained, the way you have been educated, what focus has been put on learning to learn. 
Innovation depends on how enthusiastic the corporations are around you to leverage the power of technology to gain competitive advantage. Innovation depends on how the society uh, tolerates pain or does not condemn pain. Innovation depends on at what level you are in terms of the basic needs of the society. Because as a society starts developing more and more and more, the kind of innovations also change. The need for a search algorithm, for a better search algorithm, which Google page ranking is all about, was seen as a viable idea in a society where the per capita GDP was $52,000 because there was going to be a critical mass of people <coughs> who will pay for that idea and So, as far as why India is not yet produced, I mean we will. You know, we, we came out with the global delivery model of the for work day. Indian companies were the first ones to embrace uh, the capability maturity model of the software engineers to do that model in that. Just as Japanese embraced the Deming, the Indian software industry embraced the software engineers to do that. So there have been some good things that have happened and all let's remember that this whole uh, post liberalization period is just 21 years. And as long as licensing was there, there was really not much opportunity. So therefore, I would not be too much worried about the fact that India has not produced a Google, Europe has not produced a Google, Japan has not produced a Google, don't worry about it. It's not an issue. But what, what makes me feel nice is that the, the vehicle has started moving. And as you know, the initial friction is always, the inertia is always the biggest uh, force to work on. We are moving. The trick now is not to put hurdles in the path of that way. So therefore, let all of us work together in a very constructive way. The government, the businesses, the, the academia and the civil society to ensure that whatever advantageous position that India has got into is not jeopardized. That's all. Namaste, sir. Uh, my name is Tejan. Uh, how do you see the role of CSR evolving beyond supporting NGOs or supporting local NGOs through foundation to a role of supporting the system, the public governance system that you spoke about and enabling it to withstand and sustain the developmental challenges that we have in our country right now? Uh, I think by and large, the our CSR activities, 
all over the country are being <coughs> focused on addressing the basic needs of the poorest of the land. The majority of Rightly so, because there is so much suffering in the country, there is so much poverty in the country. However, there are people, for example, Garbage has done a lot of work in wildlife conservation. I have been supporting the water registration, cleaning up of water databases. So I think if these things are happening, but I do think that there is need for a much greater involvement by corporates in improving the quality of uh, quality in the country. That is uh, what bring the power of technology to create uh, and keep up to date the electoral database, which of course is done by election commission. But still, I think, and you know, the one who is involved, uh, still there's a lot of work that can be done. Second, create uh, online as well as offline platforms to encourage candidates to bring to the awareness of the voters all the good things they have done. And at the same time, the not so good things that somebody may have done. And third, make sure that on the voting day, every employee goes and votes for the best candidate. I think if we can do that, that's the first step towards improving the, the public government system. The first step, it's not the last step. Okay, two more questions. Sure. Uh, first question. My concern is, can we talk about philanthropy and not just CSR? Can we talk about philanthropy of the arts? Because we do, we, I think we all understand the importance of, of the arts in a rounded personality and how it should it can be used also as a tool, whether it's cultural diplomacy, and actually supporting the system of the arts and understanding the importance of liberal education within, uh, at least within our families, we can do that. So can you, do you have any ideas about actually moving away from CSR into the ro role of philanthropy? Well, uh, at the end of the day, uh, a fulfilled mind requires access to the Arts. There is no doubt about it. It could be through music, painting, films, doesn't matter, whatever it is. So what the emphasis foundation does is they support folk music folk dancing, some way rural painting, etc. and rural radio. But at the same time, you need to support NPC. You need to support uh, activities that bring relaxation of mind to the elite of Bombay, Bangalore, etc. Absolutely. There is, they're all detailed. 
they didn't know about it. But then it saw it's a manual of all. Therefore, different people can choose different items from this menu. Uh, all that one could say is, whatever you do, make sure that you have a portfolio. You know, as everybody knows, when you choose a portfolio, you are reducing your risk. That is the fundamental principle of portfolio theory in investment. I think mean, that holds for everywhere. If you want to support a performance by a great artist in Western class, I am a great admirer of Western class, so it's fine. But at the same time, realize that there are other needs of the company, and therefore, just a portfolio. from MMI Nursing Home GMSP. Sir, you mentioned about the values to be followed by the corporate sector and all sectors in society. You also made a mention about the leadership by example. And there are certain groups available in our country who have followed these values and the leadership by example for the last several decades including the Infosys and the Lord with And they have successfully conducted the business. But what we observe in the society now, the graph is going up in the area of corruption, in the area of aspiration to become wealthy in the shortest possible time, by any means or options. Now, what should be done as per your feelings to contain this process? Because this may create complication. You know, as I said before, as long as it is an issue that makes this a better society, as long as you have no personal benefit from the issue, I think we should stand up and say what we feel honestly. We should not be scared. You know, I once asked the Dowers, my late wagoner, then. Of them models. To name the first attitude of a leader. It took me less than 10 seconds to say courage. Courage of conviction. Courage to take bold decisions. Courage to walk the untrodden path. Courage to push through things when there are lots of naysayers. Courage to make sacrifice. So therefore, as long as you are not benefiting from any issue, as long as you are leaving the society better, you should stay. But you have to say it courteously, you have to say it in an agreeable manner. You should not be rude, you know, you should not be pontificating, you should not be uh, you know, arrogant or arrogant. That's what I would request every business leader to do. Thank you. Thanks. So, uh, you know, we are, we are uh, enjoying these wonderful uh, premises, uh, courtesy of uh, Dr. Rashmi Kodar, and she has uh, something that looks very intriguing that she'd like to present to you.
Thank you very, very much for this interaction. Thank you.